so more great stuff to come. Right now, we are going to move into our first panel of the day. And just a real quick reminder to you, as Seema said, that if you have any questions for the panelists, you can put it in the chat in the chat there. We will uh, do our best to answer them. And if not, we will get them in the Facebook later in the Facebook group. So without further ado, we are going to move on to our panel. And this one is on resilience and resurgence, how to bounce back better, stronger together. We have three panelists with us for this. And our first one is Leslie Zahn. Leslie is passionate about what it takes to live with courage and inspiring others to do the same. Having risen from the ashes of loss, abuse, betrayal, and illness, her mission is to reach as many people as possible with the message that everyone has the ability to tap into their limitless potential and create the life they've always wanted. With over three decades teaching, coaching, and presenting on leadership, business, and mindset, she helps people overcome their limiting beliefs and stop set settling for less than the very best that life has to offer. As a successful entrepreneur, she knows what it takes to cast a vision and move in the direction of her dreams. Leslie's mission is to inspire people on a global scale to find their courage and create outrageous achievement in all areas of their life. Yes, ready for that, Leslie. <laughs> we also have Dr. Cheryl Lentz. Known as the academic entrepreneur, Dr. Cheryl is a unique and dynamic speaker who intensely connects with her audience. Having one foot in academia and one foot in the business and entrepreneurial space, her goal is to offer the audience pearls of wisdom today that they can use tomorrow in their personal and professional lives. It is not enough to know. The expectation is for participants to take action and do. Join Dr. Cheryl on her journey to connect these dots to provide inspiration, knowledge, and counsel to move forward effectively. Known globally for her writing on leadership, oh, excuse me, on leadership and failure, as well as critical and refractive thinking, she has been published more than 50 times and with 25 writing awards. An accomplished university professor, speaker, and consultant, she is an international bestseller and top quoted publishing professional on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. She took the stage as TEDx speaker in Farningale 2020 on October 10th, 2020. And last but certainly not least, we have Janice Edwards. She is an award-winning talk show host and Emmy-nominated television producer, MC, speaker, media coach, and co-author of the international bestseller, Step Into Your Brilliance. She has conducted more than 1,200 interviews, including ones with Oprah, Dr. Deepak Chopra, Chris Pine, Garth Brooks, Kerry Washington, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and President Barack Obama. Janice's company, Edwards Unlimited, the JaniceEdwards.com, produces Janice Edwards TV, high quality videos, media, and Zoom presentation training for entrepreneurs, corporations, and nonprofit organizations. She, has in, she was inducted into the Hall of Fame as a Black legend of Silicon Valley in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Janice Edwards, Dr. Cheryl Lentz, and Leslie Zahn. Zima, Zima, please take it away. Oh dear, I think we've lost Zima. <laughs> there she is. Welcome everyone. We're glad to have you. Thank you for joining. I am here. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Welcome, Cheryl, Janice, and Leslie. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so I would like to acknowledge that Leslie Zan just had her book launch on Tuesday. And she hit the number one international bestseller. So, you know, it's just so amazing that I'm in front in, with all these great people and high achievers. Congratulations, Leslie. Thank you, Seema. I appreciate it. I wonder the name of your book. Outrageous Achievement. And the response oh, has been so positive. It's just been overwhelming. So I sit before you full of gratitude and humility and excitement. <laughs> Wonderful. So let's let's get started with um, with Dr. Cheryl. Would you like to um, 
tell us a little bit about, um, we have a, so how it's going to work is we're going to have a seven minute um, a presentation from each one of them, and then we are going to go into Q&A. So as you hear, you have Q&As, please uh, send it in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we will get that to you. And uh, so we'll get started with Cheryl, and then Leslie, and then Janice. Cheryl, take it away. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. Part of what I'm going to talk about today is this F word that nobody wants to talk about. And the F word, of course, is failure. And this is something that I happen to be, unfortunately or fortunately, the queen of failure. Every major part of my life I have failed in. And it is an amazing story that I want to help you, particularly from our topic on resiliency, is how do you recover from failure? And one of my epic failures, which I'm asked to speak all over the world about, is the idea that when I was in college and barely 20 years old, I was dismissed from my life's passion. I had been studying to be an organist, meaning the organist at the Notre Dame and Holy Name Cathedral, and it was supposed to be the top of the top. And I was the only undergraduate in a graduate program. And when you graduate and go up to an upperclassman at the university, this was at the University of Illinois, you're supposed to take what's called the jury. And this is the competency exam, if you will, for a musician. I wasn't allowed to take mine. My professor walks into my practice room one day and just suddenly told me to find another line of work and my music career ended in that moment. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for that. I was stunned there wasn't a plan B, it wasn't an option. For those of you who want to know more, I have a TED talk. This is what they asked me to speak about. But the purpose here was the ability of what we're doing right now for resiliency is forced compliance. I had to, if I wanted to continue my career at the University of Illinois and my diplomas on the wall, is I had to shift because someone else told me my dream wasn't possible. And here's what I heard, which is what most of the time, all of us hear. I heard I suck. And that is not what he was trying to tell me. If anything, believe it or not, that failure when I was 20 years old was the greatest gift of my life. Now you can imagine I didn't think of it that way at 20 years old. I reacted like a petulant teenager going, oh no, you didn't. And I walked away. And this is what I want you to hear me, if nothing else today. I walked away and put that music in a box. I had been playing since I was five years old. I put it in a box, put it in the back of the closet. I didn't play for more than 30 years. Yes, that's three zero because I decided that it was too painful. How someone can kill my dream in that moment. And what my professor did was to keep yet another out of broke musician from going down a path for which my talents were not as good. Think the Olympics. Many of us are good at what we do, but we're not Olympians. And so I had to go another direction. What I would have liked to have done and what I do for my clients and my students is to help you process failure. And so that you don't let something stop you for 30 years, because here's how this mystical mindfulness works is we get messages all of the time. I found it very curious that it only is in the last few years that I began to get that message. And I had some very interesting signs and symbols. And this is the part where we really have to look at Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and the fact that we've always had the power. I have those red slippers on my desk because I really believe failure has no alibi. We have to own it. We have to understand it and we have to listen to it. Because uh, very interesting that after being on the road for 25 years, I've moved actually 38 times, I came home. Every home I looked at, including this one, had a baby grand piano in it. And I didn't understand the messages at the time. This house actually had two pianos, one in the great room, one downstairs. Still didn't listen to the message. Two years ago, November of 2019, a family interviewed me, interviewed me to be able to be the new steward for their 30 year old baby grand piano. That piano sits in my living room today. And that was the start of my journey back to heal that failure from 30 years ago. Now it didn't come easy. I didn't suddenly sit down to the piano and I'm an organist anyway, and organ and piano a little different, but I couldn't quite get the pipe organ in the great room. But as I began to play, I started to work through that pain. And this is why we don't like that F word. We run away from that pain like I did. We put it in the box, we run away because it's painful. And I went through months of trying to look at why I said goodbye to music. I didn't have to, but because of one person's opinion, being so young and not having someone to help me understand 
why I was being redirected. Honestly, I've had an amazing career and I would not have had that had my professor. Now, granted, he could have had a little bitter, better bedside manner. Sometimes the messages we get, they're a little harsh, but 30 years it took me to get that message. And now in the last, oh, since November when COVID hit, that piano was my saving grace. Music is back in my life and it has healed me from the inside out. What you'll see in the book that I wrote in there is I was actually in a wheelchair for nine months, about seven years ago. And I refuse to accept that that's what my fate was going to be. And part of it is when the body shuts down and we're not listening to our purpose, we're not living until we understand why we were here. And that resiliency is what kept me going and that motivation. And I sit behind you and you look at me going, wow, there's no way she was like that. It's like, oh yes. And I had many of my friends Humpty Dumpty me back together, but the messenger was music. And now I have music back in my life. I'm playing again, I'm dancing again, I'm going salsa dancing and ballroom dancing and all kinds of amazing things because I was willing and receptive to that resiliency, to be able to redefine myself and have the courage to own that failure and to move forward and to see what else is out there. And now I'm willing to have, as we'll see with Leslie, the courage, and I will transition to you here very well, of being able to look at how do you do that? Part of that is the willingness to stand your ground. I went through that pain step by step, tier by tier, to be able to fight for my purpose and fight for that music and to allow me the ability to finally, after 30 years, to fix that failure. Now, there's another failure that's out there, but that's for another time. But this is a part that failure has no option and failure has no alibi. So let me leave you with one quote and I'll transition to, so Leslie can show you the courageous part about this, is the idea by Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts, Winston Churchill. And with that, I will give this to Leslie. Well done, thank you so much. What a story, what a story. So on Cheryl's note, you know, that story of putting her dream in a box for 30 years, what inspires me in my work is the curiosity as to why so many people have big dreams and yet so few find the courage to make them real. And I believe Cheryl is a beautiful example in that fear, disappointment, betrayal uh, play a big role. Um, in my book, I talk about the five universal fears, fear of failure, um, in, in Cheryl's point, fear of rejection, perhaps, fear of judgment, fear of change, fear of success. So here's what I've learned about fear. We make it up. Not that it's not real, but we make it up. And it should be very liber liberating to know that if we make it up, we can just as easily unmake it up. And change begins with awareness. So I'd like you all to think about one area in your life where you feel stuck or where you feel disappointed or where you feel dissatisfied, an area where you'd like a breakthrough. It could be in your health. It could be in your relationships. It could be in your career. Like Cheryl, it could be in your creative expression. How do you harness the courage to make a change, to get unstuck? In most cases, we know what to do and we're in denial or we refuse. We know what to do. And yet, as we evaluate the options that present themselves, we think to ourselves, that's too hard. That's just too hard. I can't feel that again. I can't experience that again. I can't put myself out there again. So it's just too hard. It's too hard to get up early to exercise. It's too hard to play the piano again. It's too hard to ask my boss for a raise, or it's too hard to begin writing the book, or it's too hard to talk to my lover or partner or spouse to change the relationship. It's too hard to take the class, learn something new. You find the courage to change, I believe, by first shifting your perspective of what hard is like shifting your perspective of what hard is to be able to reframe it. So as Seema was kind enough to tell you, I just um, launched my book. So when I go back to the writing of the book, 
It took nine months to write the book. I got up at four every morning. I, 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 I've learned that some people like to weave it in throughout the day. I learn I'm a right for blocks of time type of gal. And I'm a morning person. So I would get up at four o'clock in the morning and write for a couple hours before I would do my full 10 hour work day. And so I didn't think of it as hard. In fact, I played a little game with myself as I would, before I would come into my office, instead of walking in every morning, going, this is so hard. I would stop in the living room and I would throw my arms up and I would say out loud and made my cat giggle every morning. I'd say, I wonder what fascinating stuff is going to come out of my head today. Like I shifted the whole idea that this wasn't a hard thing. This is going to be a joyful thing. You know, I learned this lesson every week in yoga. For any of you who have ever done yoga, Brene puts me in a new position. I learned years ago. She put me in a new position. I looked at her and said, that was hard. And then I immediately caught myself. And guys, because I realized if I kept saying, well, that's hard. Well, that position is always going to be hard. So now we know when I say that is a fascinating new position. So I reframe it. So it's not hard. It's just something new and different and something I'm going to go. I started cycling during COVID. I hadn't been on a bike in years. I took out my old grandma bike and rode for a little bit. And then I found a buddy who's actually a cyclist and has been a cyclist. I had to do some kind of cardio during COVID. And so I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would ride a bike on the road with the cars. And yet I transitioned to a GMC road bike. I went to real shifting. I even do the SPD clip in pedals now. And I tell you about my cycling because I, I discovered I'm a hill climber. I don't like to go downhill. I'll sprint, but man, I am a climber. There's just something about the cadence. There's something about the strength. There's something about the goal setting. There's something about the me against the hill that I really like. So I'm going to quickly tell you a story about Talbot. Talbot was the first hill I went after. Talbot is a long grade at the very top with a very steep grade. So the first time I did Talbot, I had to stop right before the grade because I didn't have the skill, I didn't have the lungs, I didn't have the heart, I didn't have the knowledge, I didn't have the skill. So I would stop, catch my breath, and then write up the grade. It took me five and a half months to climb Talbot without stopping. Now, here's the lesson why I tell you this. Because every weekend at the bottom of Talbot, I did not look up at that hill and go, oh, this is going to be really hard. I decided to go into it every weekend with what I call high intention, low attachment. High intention, I'm climbing this hill. Low attachment, hey, if I have to stop, that's not going to take all the fun out of it. I'm getting stronger. I'm getting better. My skills are improving. And one day I'm going to make it to the top of Talbot. And the day I made it to the top of Talbot without stopping was joyful. I got to tell you, I was up there dancing and singing and it was really fun. And now I am the queen of Talbot, by the way, is what I call it. So anyways, it's how we reframe what is hard. So staying stuck is a choice. Getting unstuck is a choice. And that reframing, I believe, plays a key role in that. So think where in your life you are settling because you think it's too hard. Where are you settling because it's good enough? Where are you settling because the pain isn't painful enough? Life is fleeting, my friends. I just turned 61. We launched the book on my birthday. I see 25, 25, 30 years ahead of me. And I am so clear, more clear than I've ever been in my entire life of what I want to do who I want to attract to me, I'm staying open to things that I don't even know, right? I'm not going to limit myself like this or even better. And yet, I, I, one thing I do know is that I am not going to let fear stop me from pursuing whatever it is that comes into my mind. I may not have the answers. I may still be afraid. I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be. I just know I have more courage because it's a choice, right? Because it is a choice not to settle. I don't want to settle in my career. I don't want to settle in relationships. Mr. Next is out there somewhere. And I know he's Amen. looking, he's looking for me. He just doesn't know it's me yet. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna settle in my health, which is why I ride my bike and do my yoga. I'm not gonna settle anywhere. And I and I truly do 
take moments regularly to say, am I settling? Like, am I settling here? Is this, is this good enough for me? So that's really, like I said, from the very beginning, change begins with awareness. And my, my wildest dream for everyone who's joining SEMA and all those marvelous authors and everybody who's with us today is that I want you to know that you have everything you need inside of you. You truly do to tap into your full potential, to divine the person you choose to be, to walk through the world on your terms, to create the future of your dreams. And that's the theme for today. And that is my wish for you. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Oh, excuse me, to Janice. Janice. Amen, Leslie. Thank you, dear. Thank you, Leslie. That was amazing. And thank you, Seema, for inviting me and welcome and congratulations to everyone, all of the authors, and it's wonderful to be here. So in these seven miraculous minutes that we have together, I'm going to share an experience about resetting and some strategies to support resetting with compassion, empathy, and joy. And these are designed to empower your business and personal goals to help you break free to new levels of impact, because that is what they've done for me. So November of 2019, I was heading to a business conference in Hawaii. It was part of an annual trip that the organizers had for leaders. I had not been able to go in 2018. In 2019, something within me said, you must go now. Do not put this off until 2020. Two days before the trip, my iPhone just shut down. The screen was black and I could not get it to function. I spent hours, hours that I wanted to use packing, on the phone with customer service and nothing that they recommended made a difference. Mm -hmm. Screen was still black. I got to the plane and I was in a row of three with Sarah and Dan, this lovey dovey couple. We chit chatted about things and I told them about my phone dilemma. Actually, I complained about my phone problem. And Sarah said, oh, I've had that happen to me before. Just say Siri reset. <laughs> I said, okay, Siri, reset. And voila, the screen came back on. The icons are all there. The phone worked. And it happened just as the plane was taxiing down the runway. Wow. I have had many times in my life, especially over this past year, but other times as well, well, I've had to say, Janice, reset. And I want you to know today that breaking free and resetting your life right now is absolutely possible. And in this amazing summit, you have the tools that you need to do it. And it can start with just speaking the words when you know it's time to reset. We know the power of words and of setting an intention. I love the scripture from Job. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto you and light shall shine upon your ways. The first action is to recognize the need for the reset. Tell yourself both the soft truths and the hard truths about what is happening, how your mind, body, soul, and spirit are responding to it. And do this with compassion toward yourself, appreciation for what you're doing well, and then strategy and structure for up-leveling what you're doing. Are you hiding in plain sight because of how you've had to live for the past year? You may feel more exposed because even as you're speaking on camera, people are looking at the books on your bookshelf or a photo and making a decision about you. Do you need to find new places of sanctuary and safety even as you open your space to the world? It's okay. Just tell yourself the truth, then identify strategies for successfully navigating that and ask for help without embarrassment. If I hadn't shared my story with Sarah, I never would have known about the reset command. Now, with that same lens of compassion that you've turned toward yourself, extend empathy to others. Do you judge when your colleague who used to be the first in the conference room can't seem to make it on time to a Zoom meeting at the kitchen table? Maybe that person needs a reset too. Where is there an opportunity for grace that you can extend to others? Is there an opportunity or a need to forgive others as you forgive yourself so that you can really feel your light shining through and others can experience your brilliance? When it comes to resetting for your brilliant light to shine through, 
What do you love to do? What makes you feel like you're not just treading water through this pandemic? Where can you find joy? When it came to my phone, I said reset, and I wanted it just the way it was before. As Laurel mentioned, I've interviewed over 1,200 people, celebrities, newsmakers, community leaders in different locations all over. And I recognize that this reset may never be the same as things were, but through the grace of technology, the way we are connecting today, I have so much joy in being here with you. Where's your joy? Where can you find joy despite what is happening? Identify what connects you to your passion and your purpose and identify how you can incorporate a portion of that every day. When can you take time to walk on ground instead of concrete? What taste sensations create a party in your mouth? Where can you expand your faith and your spiritual practices? Whether it's a TikTok or Instagram video, sharing a private moment with a puppy, a movie that makes you laugh or thrills you, or luscious love with someone in your bubble. Embrace it as an event and fully experience it. Tell your inner critic to take a nap and let it go. You've got this. Hold on to that joy with courage. Hold on as tightly as you would hold on to a toddler's hand crossing a busy street. Your inner child and your brave adult deserve that moment, that hour, that day of joy. And in that restoration, you will find your reset. And in your reset, you will recognize that all things are possible. Only believe. Seema? Amazing wonderful. wisdom from these three wonderful ladies. Oh my goodness, I've learned so much. I, I hope you have picked up on many nuggets. They have said many, many important things. Amazing. Um, hmm. um, so I'm looking at a few questions that have come in. Um, so this is not going to be in any particular order, but Janice, I wanted to ask you, I, from you know my experience of coaching people and my own experience of of you know the challenges I had to overcome, many times people think reset is not a good thing. It's like oh why I can't reset I can't do this I I have to continue the way I was. So can you speak to that? I am reset is uh, in my opinion uh, yeah it's not a, a, a bad thing. But can you speak on that a little bit? Absolutely, Seema, and I'm glad to. And, and with my clients and with myself, I think about it. I, one of the things I wrote about in that chapter in Step Into Your Brilliance and that I've shared is that my mom was ill for 16 years before she passed. And while she was ill and when I realized that the miracle prayer of wanting her to be healed was not going to be answered like I hoped it would be, I used to think, I don't know if I'll ever have joy again. How will I ever do that. And so I had to find even in those moments where I wanted to freeze dry those moments and think I want to hold on to this forever. What am I grateful for? Where is the joy? I've had to adjust to a lot of new normals and we're never saying that we would have wanted to go through those things, whether it's been a life threatening illness, the loss of a loved one, oh my goodness, everything in this pandemic. It's not that, but it's that where in those moments can you say, okay, I have to reset. Otherwise, I'm just going to be under this. How do I come up? Mm -hmm. Where do I find power? Where do I find passion? Where do I connect? And sometimes, you know, they've said that during this time, we're using 75% of the energy and the brain power that we were using before shelter in place was the reality. So if that 75% is there and I need more rest, how do I not judge myself? How do we not judge the reset? And maybe then the reset is not even calling it a reset. Maybe it's, you know, and maybe you don't want to do normal. Maybe it's just now. And maybe in this moment now, what can you do? You know how they talk about that with a temptation. Can you just not eat that for the next two minutes? Can you just not pick up a cigarette for the next two minutes? Can you, and then also declaring yeah. what you want. Because I say there's no loss in, in, in reaching for that. I, I, 
I never felt like because I would do everything I could to try to extend my mom's life that it was a loss. I mean, I was upset she was gone, but I will fight for that. And I think that's one of the things that right now, if we're tired, we can admit it to ourselves, but then we fight, fight for your vision, fight for your life, fight for your truth, fight for what you've dreamed of despite what is there, because that's when we see things shift. And we, and, and the truth is that miracles are around us in the atmosphere. And sometimes there's, there's that push to just give up. And it's like, fight against that and get people to help you with that. I mentioned cutting toxic guests from the roster in my free gift of the five keys to being the reality show in the star of your own life. And so I'll just say, whether that's a person, your negative habits, your thoughts, and sometimes it can be beloved family members, but you've got to set boundaries because that will help you also to triumph when you have to do a reset. Brilliant. Yes. And I so agree with that. It's the most difficult thing to do, but when you do it, you, you, you get a whole new life. And that's exactly what happened to me, especially when I had to, you know, not participate with the people, certain people anymore. That was the hardest thing because you've been with them all your life, but my whole life flourished after I did that. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Um, let's just go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I said it's so true. I agree with you. And I'm glad you discovered that. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, May Davis says, thanks, Janice, for the reminder to reset. Simple reminder, but yet powerful concept. Um, you all are great. Leslie, okay. this next question is for you. We all want to be happy. I guess I'm assuming we all want to be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you have a unique differentiation between happiness and joy. So mm -hmm. let's let's talk about that. How does how does this play in in the resurgence that we're talking about? Well, as I I've given this a lot of thought, a lot of writing, a lot of study. So for me, doesn't have to be right for everyone, but for me, happiness is based on external things. External things in our life. So I'm happy if I have the boy. I'm happy if I'm in the right size gene. I'm happy if I have the job. I'm happy if I have the money. I'm happy if, you know, I, I, all these external things. So when all this is happening, I'm happy. And then if I don't get the boy or I don't have the money or they don't have the job or I don't make the hill, I'm not happy. And it robs my happiness. You know, there's that interesting phrase that everyone knows that the universe works perfectly. Well, the universe works perfectly. Well, they, it, it, people only usually tend to use that when things are going well. You know, something really good happens. Like, wow, the universe works perfectly. I mean, but you lose your job or you're on home isolation or we've got a global pandemic and all the civil unrest and political unrest. And I don't hear people going around saying, hey, the universe is working perfectly now. So when we base our happiness <laughs> on all this external things, we not only become unhappy when it doesn't happen, and, and then it becomes pervasive, I believe. We're not just unhappy because I'm not in the right size genes. Pretty soon, I'm just plain old unhappy, and it becomes pervasive in all areas mm -hmm. of our life. For me, joy is completely different, and joy is that internal flame. Uh, joy is that our, our, our compass, our true north, that no matter what is going on in our life, if I can keep my joy flame lit, which I do, then no matter what is going on, I can maintain that sense of joy and I don't lose it because of what's happening externally. Um, you know, it always makes me think of what the Buddhists say about suffering. You know, suffering is when we are unwilling to accept what's really going on. And so my, I'm more willing or less willing to suffer when my joy flame is lit. And so regardless of what is going on in the world, I can maintain that joy and it manifests into all areas of my life. Oh, that's beautiful. It's a very different and unique way of looking at it. And you talk about settling quite a bit. I, I keep saying that if you have to settle, settle for more. <laughs> if you have to settle, settle for more. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Right? Because then at least 
It's because it's hard to get out of some habits, right? It takes a while. So if you're used to settling, let's not settle for less. Start settling for more and say, you know what? I'm going to settle for more. <laughs> so Cheryl, I thought I was the queen of failure. <laughs> I should be giving that talk that you're giving. <laughs> what has been your biggest lessons, the important key lessons from the gifts of failure in your life? I have several big ones. And the biggest point is very similar to the never settle. Um, I'm a sorority girl. And one of our mottos is to ability to always live each day to its ultimate good. And I don't ever want to come to the end of the story and have any regrets. And that's what drives me because I have too many already. And the good news is, is failure was able to shift me in a direction. And now I have the option and the choice to Leslie's point of being able to correct some failures. Not often do we get a second chance or even a third. And so my point is until that fat lady sings, whoever she is, she's not going to do it on my watch because I am not gonna leave this world with ever living anything undone. I have so much I wanna do that I don't want any regrets that I have a sense of urgency right now. But that wasn't always the case because I was stuck in the good enough and I will not settle for good enough anymore. I will only settle. And I like yours though, they're gonna steal this, right? Settle for more, but it's my choice. And that's the part that failure has taught me. I could have stayed stuck and I did for 30 years, not just that, but I also loved, lost the love of my life. And I don't know if I'm going to get a second chance mm. on the phone. But the point is, is we screw up a lot of things when we're too young to know the skills. And I think we sometimes get those opportunities way more. Who knows you're going to meet the love of your life when you're 20, right? And the fact is that certain things happen. And yes. now we look at the idea of maturity has to take over, but I will not settle. And I will hope and help the universe to kind of help my manifesting along but when the end comes, I have lost some good friends recently, and I will make sure that there. you never regret what you do. You regret what you didn't. I will not regret what I didn't do. I guarantee you. Yes. Courage, Camille, that is right? Beautiful. That is so well said. Yeah, and that, the, this is the whole point, people. This is the whole point of having this summit. This is the whole point of having the book Break Free to Peace, Love, and Unity, and all the you know, bringing people of all shapes, sizes, colors, and backgrounds. So you can see we're saying all the same things. There's no, we're all humans first, right? The basic level is we're humans. It doesn't matter what culture, what religion, what whatever background you think, your circumstances, those things don't matter because at the very basic level, we are all humans with all the same type of needs. So they're all saying the same thing. It's your choice. Sometimes we feel, yes, that there's a lot of things that have happened and has happened to me too, where adversity happens and you didn't choose it. And it wasn't because of you. It was because of life circumstances, because of others. But you still have a choice. And one of the choice, like for me, was to not be beaten down. I will not be beaten down. And it's that instinct, your gut feeling, that it's that fight and fight, um, flight mode that we have where your body is protects you and you have that inner innate thing you just need to listen in tune in that's why i said in the beginning tune into your heart put your hand on your heart and ask right now what is that that i need to hear what is it that i need to change we would love to hear from you what what are your important lessons from your failure what is the difference in um for you and the meaning of happiness and joy. Share on Facebook comments and share in the comments here. What does your version of reset mean to you? Um, what, is, what is all of that for you? Let's hear from you, let's share that. And uh, one last question that I would like to ask all of you is, we're doing a lot of Zoom and we're doing a lot of media things and we're coming up with a lot of authors where everyone's writing books, right? What is a quick tip for changing your state when you have to show up in media or on Zoom? Janice, let's start with you. Yes, and that's something that I teach my clients too. Couple of things. One of them is choose a theme song. For example, mm. I there's a song by Marvin Gaye that was created years ago that would say, Janice is my girl. 
in all the world. And he said, there's no one sweeter. I used to listen to that. And then it turned out that <laughs> they did a new theme song for my show. Ron Scott put my name in it and it says Janice Edwards. It's showtime. It's time to shine. And so I use that for everyone. Think about it, it's showtime. It's time to shine. But a quick way is to have a song that's your go-to theme song. And another thing is to imagine that as you are walking into the room or showing up on Zoom, everyone is saying, Seema, I love you. Cheryl, I love you. Leslie, I love you. And that mm. welcoming and that sense of safety and connection then just empowers you to shine through and to connect in a greater way. That's beautiful. Wow. One of the techniques beautiful. that I do is I oh, actually Cheryl. close my eyes and say a prayer. And it's one of those, because we all talked about this in our, our meetings yesterday is how you practice something is not how it's going to happen. Unless you're doing a TED talk, which is memorized, <laughs> all of this is going to flow from you. And so I learned long ago, it's not about me. And that is the key element that I will give everyone here. It has nothing to do with me. I just happen to be the messenger. And when you get to have the honor and privilege, like today is the words were chosen specifically for this group. I just happen to be the mouthpiece to distribute them. Believe that's how things work. And no, it's not about you. It's all about service. And Zig Ziglar, for those of you who don't know who it is, it's aging me just a little bit. But in order to get what you want, you have to get what everyone else wants first. And so first be of service. And I guarantee you, you're going to rock the world. Yep. Y'all see us to bend on one knee. I'll see that's you right. at the top. Yes, we are aging ourselves, but that's not a bad <laughs> thing. So I have a, a mix of the two of both Janice and Cheryl. Definitely music. So Bruno Mars, Uptown Funk. I'm sorry. Four and a half minutes of dancing around. <laughs> And no matter what mood I'm in, if you can't be happy after that, you just can't be happy. Although I have a second one that I've learned, Jason Mraz, have it all. So I'll listen to Jason Mraz, have it all. Yeah. You know, and so my visualization is for the audience to have it all. And so music definitely is a great state change. And then I have a sticky all over my house that says, be willing to see things differently. And it reminds me that no matter what is happening, I'm going to be willing to see things differently. So it keeps me from being reactive and more proactive. So before mm -hmm. I take the Zoom, I'm willing to see things differently. It, remind, it reminds me of my gratitude that I do what I love to do. It reminds me that service drives everything in my life. It's in my core values and my top five core values. And I remind myself to have fun. Right. I, mean, I rank very high in the fun factor because learning and joining and community and collaboration should be fun. Rock on. Amen. Yes. So you can tell this is a party group. That is what, that, this is a celebration and party. That is wonderful, amazing tips. And that's, you guys are, I, I guess I'm doing all the right things. I listened to music before we started. And I also gave my per, per, myself permission not to be perfect. When you're putting on an event like this, an all day event, there's so many minute details you have to focus on. And I have team all across the world helping with this and managing different aspects of it all. And, um, we all, you know, tech, there's a lot of things out in our control, especially technology, but we always assume things are going to go bad, right? But you also can assume that things are going to go better than you expected. And I always say it out in, in the beginning, you know, we strive for excellence, but there's a lot of things not in our control. And when I, we, I say that, last time I said that in my event, even the attendees were like, oh my God, that that now I feel relieved. I mean, the attendees were feeling relieved, which was surprising to me, but yes, it's, it is there. And it is in the imperfections that we are perfect. So I want to really highlight that, that it is the imperfections. No one is expecting you to be perfect. We expect ourselves to be perfect. But now I've started saying I strive for excellence and as it unfolds is how it's meant to be. Oh, Thank beautiful. you, ladies, so much for joining us. And there are some um, questions still in the chat, so please feel free to go in when you have time and answer that for the rest of the people. We're also on Facebook. And lovely questions. Um, I just wanted to say something about Laurel Beth. 
I hope I don't, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your last name, Laura Beth Messimer. She says she just bought the book and she looks forward to reading it. Thanks for putting this summit together with all these amazing women. <laughs> so thank you, Laura Beth, for buying the book and, and being part of the summit. It's wonderful. I'm going to hand this back over to Laurel. Thank you, ladies. I hope you continue to stay on, on the day with us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to jump in and feel like I just jumped in the party for just a second on this room. <laughs> that was amazing. Janice, I'm gonna follow your lead. That was fantastic. I'm gonna say, I love you. I'm gonna say, Leslie, I love you. Cheryl, I love you. Seema, I love you. I love saying I love you now, even more after that explanation. So and Laura, we love you too. Oh, no, <laughs> we, we love you. you. <laughs> It's a love, love fest. It's a party love fest. Let's yeah. get that music and get me you know, start yes! dancing. I know. Ooh, I'm ready. <laughs> you just reminded me, Cheryl. Actually, I was thinking, you know what? I haven't even said to anybody, take dance breaks. When oh, you I'm doing salsa and ballet and ballroom, whatever gets me up in the morning. You got to get moving. Right, right. I did that this morning, and Bruno Mars was on my playlist this morning, Leslie. Yes. <laughs> and it um, changes things, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah, he's so good. Agreed. Agreed. Well, thank you all. That was fantastic. I feel like I have more tools in my tool belt now to go forward in the day. So That's thank you. Wonder.